Good afternoon. My name is Irvin Rosenfeld. I'm the second longest patient in the United States receiving medical cannabis provided by the federal government. Again, as we all mentioned here before, uh, I wish we were standing here on this podium now with Bob Randall here, but yet he's definitely in the spirit. Yes. Anyway, uh, my bone disorder, I get it for, the medical name is multiple congenital cartilaginous exostosis and a variant of the syndrome pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. In layman's terms, it means bone tumors on the end of long bones, on all my long bones in my body, which mostly grow outwardly, uh, growing into the muscles and the veins, making it very easy to tear muscles and tear veins, plus uh, makes it very uh, easy, uh, to cause considerable pain. Now, this disorder hit me really uh, mostly at age 13. I started having numerous operations, taking all kinds of numerous prescriptions, including uh, Darvon, Codeine, um, uh, Dilaudid, all different medicines and everything else. But those were prescribed, those were legal, so that was okay to take. Uh, and in high school, I was relegated to a homebound teaching because I was having surgeries every year, and in Virginia, they were scared if I hurt myself on the school grounds, I would sue the school system. So I had the best teachers in the school system coming to me five o'clock in the afternoon teaching me at home uh, private uh, tutoring. So that was a really good education. So when I graduated, I went to try college. Before I did that in high school, because uh, I didn't go to school and because I was a good spokesperson, and I was against illegal drugs. They would have me come to assemblies and speak to the kids, saying, why would a healthy person use an illegal drug when here I am having to take all these legal drugs? I'd hold up my baggie with all the prescriptions and say, you know, you really shouldn't use illegal drugs. Went to college in Miami because of warm weather. And uh, I actually moved down to Miami to move in with a girlfriend of mine. And uh, she smoked the whole, she smoked marijuana, and we broke up. I kicked her out. About 30 days later, I wasn't making any friends in high school and in, in college, and so therefore, <laughs> therefore, I finally gave in to peer pressure and tried marijuana. It was totally benign. It didn't do anything to me. I thought it was pure garbage. And so if that's all it took to be accepted by my, my peers in college, well, so be it. So about the 10th time I did it, I was sitting playing a game of chess, and up to that point, for the last five years, I've not been able to sit for more than 10 or 15 minutes because of the tumors all over my body, and especially my legs. So immediately I thought, what way did I take all the narcotics I had, which was morphine, which was quaalude, which was muscle relaxants, which was anti-inflammatory drug, you name it, I had it. And it dawned on me, I hadn't taken anything for four to five hours. Well, why could I sit all of a sudden? And just then, the joint came to me. And I looked at this thing, and I'm thinking, this is the only thing I'm doing differently. I'm smoking this garbage. So at that point, I figured, well, let me call my doctor in Virginia and see if there's any medical benefit in marijuana. I contacted him, he wasn't, never heard of it. I then contacted my family. Uh, my great uncle was head of one of the heads of pediatrics at Johns Hopkins. My regular uncle taught pediatrics at Yale. My sister taught, uh, taught nuclear medicine at Duke. So I had a very good medical backdrop. That was one reason I was able to survive, because I was told at age 10 I wouldn't outlive my teenage years. So I told him what I had found out, that maybe marijuana might work. We researched it, and lo and behold, we found that it had been used, as we've learned today, for centuries, for anti-inflammatory, for muscle relaxant, for pain control. And I went, voila, that's exactly what I need. Called the doctor back, and he had researched it and come with that same conclusion. And so I said, well, give it to me. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And I went, why? He said, the federal government outlawed it. I said, you mean I have to take on the federal government to get my medicine? And that started a 10-year battle. And for the first five years, I wrote my own scientific project with my doctor as a, as a sponsoring doctor, and me as the only patient with this rare bone disorder. And FDA kept stonewalling me. Uh, I hadn't been to this research center, I hadn't done this, I hadn't done that. Meanwhile, I, what I found is that when before I had marijuana, I would be crawling on the floor with muscle pains, tearing muscles, tearing veins, hemorrhaging. The, the medicines really didn't work at all. Marijuana now, when I did have it, A, it did enhance the use of Dilaudid, so I didn't take as much Dilaudid, so it did work in that respect. Also, I didn't have these debilitating colds, these hemorrhages, these, these, these crying, these screaming fits of, of, of not being able to walk for two days because of the tearing of the muscles with these tumors wrapped around me. So at that point, I realized, A, I need the marijuana, so the scientific project was the only way to do that. They kept stonewalling me, and in 1976, Bob Randall won his case. I read about it, and that year he came to Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. I went and met him and told him what I've been doing for the last five years, trying to get the science of the project um, uh, 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 started. He had said that the federal government had no intentions of ever giving it to anybody else, but that if I wanted to fight for it, that maybe I had a chance, but it might take another five years. Well, you know, he was right, it took another five years. But you know, in November of 82, with the help of Normal, with the help of, of uh, Alice and Bob, uh, Alice O'Leary and Bob Randall, with the help of there were a lot of people working, but I did it myself. I mean, you had to fight for yourself, okay? So I was most of the main person. But I was able to become the second patient that today I could, thankfully, be able to hold up a prescription 
and say, here, this is legal, anywhere in the United States, in the U.S. territory. government always says that we don't have research, we haven't done this, we haven't done that. Well, you know, this is what the study was showing in Missoula. I've been documented, I've been using 10 to 12 marijuana cigarettes per day for 31 years. Documented. Okay? You're not a raving lunatic. Not a raving lunatic, no. I've, <laughs> no I haven't been caught yet. <laughs> uh, anyway, because of this, okay, I'm able to lead what I consider a very fairly normal life. I've been married 29 years. I'm a stockbroker handling millions of dollars on a daily basis, which again, the government says I shouldn't even be able to think using this medicine. <laughs> you know, uh, like I said, I've been married 29 years. I'm a, a, a good sailor. I, I sail in the disabled sailing program. And I'm very active in the communities and, and, and trying to give back to others. But the whole point is this, that when somebody has a devastating disease, all they want is the right medicine and not to be made a criminal to try to get that right medicine. Again. <laughs> over there, Dr. Juan Sanchez Rambos, who was on my, my uh, project for five years. And one thing I reminded him, and I reminded all doctors, you know, it's good to have a caring doctor. It's, it's hard to find. It's like a good stockbroker. They're difficult to find, but they're out there. So you have a good, you have a good caring broker, you have a good caring physician. They don't want their hands tied behind their back. Okay, well, that was what was happening with, with Dr. Sanchez Ramos. But now, okay, no one else can get it. The program was shut down, which is a sad aspect of it, because so many other patients could use it. So what this study is trying to show is, hey, look, here is somebody, a guinea pig, for 31 years that's been using this, and as y'all will see, I'm in great shape. Okay, for my age. My age, right? Good <laughs> <laughs> little good for you to sit there. Okay. Uh, we're the ones who have to get up and talk. Okay, the doctors can't do it. They, they're harassed by DEA. Regular individuals can't do it. They can be prosecuted, their jobs, whatever. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that all my clients know I use this as a medicine. They knew I was coming out here. They were applauding me that I was coming out here. To try to further the cause is very important. That's why we did it. You know, one thing I forgot, and uh, David's report, David Berman's report this morning reminded me, and I've forgotten this, okay, when I looked at his, his report on Bob Randall, that Bob got it from the federal government in 1976, okay? He had it. That was it. He got it. He won his case. He was fine. Then he started going around the college campuses where I heard him. The federal government took it away from him. Because he said, we can't go around talking about it. We just gave it to you and no one else. <laughs> Bob could have showed up at that point and said, oh, sorry, you know. He didn't do that, did he? He didn't do that at all. He got one of the top law firms in Washington, D.C. behind him. He took on the federal government and he won. And that's what helped us get us here today. And even though we're getting uh, persecuted and, and bothered by DE and everybody else, that's we're still going to stand up for our rights and say, here we are. We're patients. It works for us. Thank you very much.